Hi there. Welcome back to Psychiatry XR, where we are on a mission to inspire worldwide conversations and innovation around the use of extended reality in psychiatric care. I'm your host, Kim Bullock, and I'm a clinical professor and XR researcher in Stanford School of Medicine. I'm board certified in psychiatry, behavioral neurology, and neuropsychiatry, as well as lifestyle and medicine. But please note that this podcast is distinct from my own clinical teaching and research roles at Stanford. The information provided is not medical advice and should not be considered or taken as a replacement for medical advice. I'm excited to be joined by my two co-creators, Jessica and Faiza. Hi, Kim. Hi, Faiza. I'm so glad to be here. I am a healthcare reporter and co-founder of Collective XR, and our other co-creator is Faiza Arshad. Hi, Kim and Jessica. Looking forward to this exciting conversation on our episode today. Yeah, so am I. So we've created Psychiatry XR, which is a monthly podcast for all XR and behavioral health stakeholders, including clinicians, researchers, allied professionals, developers, investors, patients, and just plain anyone fascinated by the ways in which evidence-based mental health and technology intersect. And so in each episode, we invite a new guest to shine light and insight into the potential benefits, challenges, and questions around immersive technologies and mental health. So for our episode today, we are truly delighted to have a very special guest, psychologist and um, pioneer VR clinician, uh, Dr. Elizabeth McMahon, who has been one of my clinical supervisors Uh, And we're hoping that our conversation today with Dr. McMahon will give you some insights into how extended reality is being used and taught to clinicians treating anxiety disorders. Dr. McMahon is a quintessential clinical psychologist who specializes in helping people overcome fears, phobias, and other anxieties. She was an early adopter of virtual reality for therapy and has been using VR with clients since 2010. Her instructional books include Virtual Reality Therapy for Anxiety, A Guide for Therapist, A Self-Help Workbook, Overcoming Anxiety and Panic, Interactive Guide, and a chapter on using virtual reality to treat anxiety in the book called Digital Delivery of Mental Health Therapies. In addition to her private practice, she teaches continuing education workshops to train therapists on anxiety treatments, including the use of VR. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. McMahon. Kim, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So, Dr. McMahon, um, can you share a little bit about yourself to our listeners? Maybe some things I don't think I've ever even taken the time to ask you, even though I've known you for a long time about what made you first interested in psychology and when and why did you start using VR for psychological care? You know, I started out majoring in music or English and decided that what I really wanted was what touched people's hearts and souls, which was psychology. It's a wonderful mix of emotion and intellect. You you combine scientific research with empathy and intuition. And I developed a specialty in anxiety because over time, the research just kept showing that we had effective treatments. Mm -hmm. And then I've been using VR since 2010 because I came across this research literature that said exposure using virtual reality was as effective as the gold standard proven effective approach of exposure in real life, in vivo exposure. So I was like, oh, I've got to have that. I got to have that for my patients. So it sounds like you've seen it evolve quite a bit. How has it actually evolved since you began using extended reality in treatment? Well, there's been a great increase in the number of virtual environments, in the number of variables that you can control so that you can individualize and tailor the experience to help your patients to the maximum extent to optimize their chance of success. There are more companies that create VR or XR specifically designed for psychotherapy. Equipments become more affordable. The faster pixel refresh rate means that there's much less nausea or what used to be called cyber sickness. There are more applications. Um, There are even self-help apps, although there are pros and cons to that. But it's been an exciting, it's been exciting to see this, this grow, more research, more uses, uh, more benefit. 
Dr. McMahon, how do you use VR in your practice? Can you talk a little bit about how you've used it for your patients? That's a great question, Faisa. I'd love to. Um, I've used augmented reality mostly in treating insect phobias, but what I use most is virtual reality. And I love it because it has so many clinical applications. You know, you can use it to help people learn and practice skills like diaphragmatic breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness, focus of attention. You can help people achieve a sense of calm, of peace, safety. You can help them feel grounded. You can help them self-soothe by having them go into virtual environments that they find calming, relaxing, or beautiful and pleasurable. You can lift mood. Um, but by far, the most powerful and probably the most common use at this point is for virtual reality exposure therapy, you know, for controlled, repeatable virtual experiences that help people overcome fears and heal from the effects of trauma by gradually facing their feared situations safely with active therapist support. And this can even be done remotely during teletherapy in video therapy. That's so wonderful. Yeah. So I, I feel like, too, one of the challenges is getting clinicians to um, expose themselves to using this. <laughs> so there's a, kind of getting them to accept and, and, and get less fearful about it. So um, one of the questions that's usually asked, I wondered what, how you answer it and what you think is how do clients usually respond um, to being introduced to virtual reality, do they are they usually positive, um, or when they're not, um, what kinds of skepticism or resistance comes up, um, or anything else you think that providers should be mindful when they're starting to introduce VR to um, their their clients. Clients are either enthusiastically eager or willing with usually a silent reservation or skepticism, because the most common feedback I get is, oh, wow, I didn't think it would be this real. <laughs> uh, but the other most common feedback I get is this really made a difference. They feel more confident. They feel like they make fast progress um, over half my current practice is people who sought me out because I offer virtual reality. They, you know, people read about it, they hear about it, and they think it gives them hope that maybe they might truly be able to get over their fear of driving, their claustrophobia, their, their fear of flying, that it might really help free them from the constriction and restrictions of, of fear. Do you think that virtual reality has been a beneficial added tool to your belt? Absolutely. It allows me to provide therapeutic experiences that are otherwise impossible. In virtual reality, I can control the weather. I can control the degree of turbulence on the plane. We can do takeoff over and over and over and over until you're comfortable. I can control the audience response, the size of the room that you're in if you're trying to get over claustrophobia. I can control the height at which you are uh, in the therapy session. And we can go as slowly or as quickly as works for you. Um, people seem to get over their fears faster. And we know that not everyone can imagine well and that the ability to create vivid mental images declines with age. And virtual reality simply takes care of that problem. I see what my patient sees. I hear what they hear. I speak with them so that on the one hand, they're there. And the one, on the other hand, I'm there with them in their head, guiding them, supporting them. So my yes, sense I, is they have they have a more lived experience of success. Yeah, I mean it's the embodiment of precision and personalized medicine, and I I can't understand why more people aren't using it. You know, 
um, I, I, yeah. So yeah, you can customize and personalize it for and just meet the person where they are. Yes, I can treat. I can treat anxiety disorders without virtual reality, Mm -hmm. but why would I? Right. VR makes it easier, faster, and in my experience, more effective. So are there any um, clients that come to you? I mean, maybe you have a selection bias because they're coming to you knowing that you're the a world's expert on VR in psychotherapy, but um, do you ever get patients that are that just can't do it, and then you have to um, uh, resort to just plain old vanilla exposure therapy? Of course, nothing's going to work for everybody, but I have to say that um, I can probably count on the fingers of one hand mm-hmm. the number of people who have just been too gotten too queasy or too nauseous uh, or just somehow like my husband can't use VR because there's something about his astigmatism correction and his glasses. He just can't get a good focus. But in, let's see, I'm in my 12th year mm-hmm. of using VR with patients. And I'd say I've had fewer than five people who And is it it. mostly just because of the physical restraints or sensations that are disturbing? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. That's common with a lot of medicines too. I mean, it's not that every single medicine works exactly the same for every patient. So. Absolutely. Sure. I bet the rate, uh, yeah, the rate of side effects is probably much less than a medicine. Well, and occasionally people will say, well, my phobic trigger, well, they usually don't use those words, but you know, what really makes me scared is not in the virtual environment. So for example, um, I had one person who said, well, what really scares me is the bump on landing. Um, Mm. But on the other hand, if I'm seeing them in person, I can put them in a chair and I can stand behind them and I can provide that bump Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, put them in a, put them in one of those recliner chairs and, and bump it. Um, Yeah. And I figure sometimes the reptilian brain, you might think, you know, what the prompter is, but it can be so implicit and context dependent that you're able to put the context there, even while you talk about it, or there's, there's enhancements, even if it's not the exact trigger prompter that that person believes it to be, it can still be additive in some way. It can. It can. Um, um, and, and, and think about the things. I mean, VR lets you do things that you can't otherwise do. For example, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if someone is afraid of blood draws or injections, in VR, we can just have it provide, we, we can have them get a blood draw or an injection over and over and over and over again. Well, yes. you, you know, you'd blow out the vein. You can't do that in real life. Yeah, the amount of repetitions and the dosage, we can get so much more of a dosage and I love it. Well, it, so in a, a hundred years, um, how would you like to see extended reality being used in psychiatric and mental health um, care? And what do you think, what do you see as the challenges or things that we need to solve to, to get to your vision, if you have one? I think my vision would be using it to treat more mental health issues. It's already being expanded and they're exploring using it with body image issues, Mm -hmm. with eating disorders, with ADHD, with auditory hallucinations, um, expanding the uses to improve quality of life, to provide safe, effective training, to connect remote work teams. Um, I think, I think the challenge is to use it to facilitate, say, deep interpersonal connections in therapy and otherwise, not act as though it's some kind of a replacement. And that the real challenge, the real goal is to use immersive technologies thoughtfully with unbiased evaluation of their actual impacts and effects. You know, what trainings, what interventions, what technology, what interactions are best done through immersive technology, which are best done in person? Um, And how can we safeguard, how can we take the lessons we learned from social media and the internet? 
how can we put some safeguards in place to try to minimize the misuse of this tool? Because immersive technologies are not inherently therapeutic. It's a tool, not a treatment. And like any tool, it can be used to help and it can be used to harm. I totally agree, Dr. McMahon. And, and how do you think that clinicians or providers can facilitate the, that improvement in extended reality for psychiatric or medical care? I would encourage, go to the literature, look at the research, understand how to use this tool, and look at how it fits with your current practice and with what you know as a clinician. Um, take reasonable precautions before you use it. You know, ask if there's a history of seizures, uh, check if they get nauseous, uh, you know, describe the virtual environment before you put someone in VR and, and monitor them, stay actively engaged with them. But I would really say, ask for research when a company or uh, you see a new VR app coming up really step back and ask who designed it did they use clinicians is it consistent with evidence based best practices is it consistent with what we know about mental health and with research and keep asking what's your research support have you evaluated that what are the data thank you so much and did you have any remaining thoughts or messages that we didn't cover that you'd love to share with our listeners? Well, if you're a therapist and this has intrigued you, I invite you to sign on to the Society for Virtual Reality Therapy website. That's svrt.org because you'll find there videos explaining and talking about and demonstrating the use of virtual reality to treat needle phobia and injection fears, as well as information about what's available clinically and how to think through and decide what you might want to use and what would be appropriate for your clinical practice. Um, I would encourage you to look into this because it's an incredibly flexible, useful, powerful clinical tool. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that website is such a gift uh, to the world and has a lot of content that is available to um, all clinicians. And so um, thank you for helping support that and for all you do. Um, you're such a great uh, mentor and a leader in the field and give us all hope and are paving the way. So um that's that's it for this episode. And um, this is the Psychiatry XR podcast. And Dr. McMahon, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insights with us today. We hope to have you on again. And um, you gave a very realistic and conversational dive into emerging XR solutions for us for mental and behavioral health. And thank you, everyone, for listening. This episode was brought to you by Psychiatry XR, the psychiatry podcast about immersive technology and mental health. And for more information about Psychiatry XR, please visit our website at www.psychiatryxr.com and make sure to subscribe to the podcast and tune in again next month to hear from another guest on XR and psychiatric care. Uh, you can join us monthly on Apple Podcasts, Twitter, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Kim Bullock produced this podcast with the help of Faiza Arshad and Jessica Hagen, and we credit and are so grateful to Austin Hagen for music and audio production. See you next time. Thank you.